Drake, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's Thunderdome debate. Our position is that the U.S. should take actions to revoke China's permanent normal trade relations status. Late last year, the bipartisan U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission unanimously recommended that Congress consider revoking PNTR pending an administration assessment of China's compliance with its WTO commitments. Any such assessment will show long-standing and wide-ranging violations by China. In February of this year, USTR explained that China has a, quote, long record of violating, disregarding, and evading WTO rules to achieve its industrial policy objectives, and quote, causing harm to American workers and industries. WTO enforcement tools have been woefully ineffective. Indeed, USTR concluded that China's reliance on a state-led, non-market approach to trade has only increased since it joined the WTO in 2001. In short, granting China PNTR in 1999 did not deliver the benefits that were promised. Supporters claimed that PNTR would be a win-win situation and that bringing China into the WTO would lead to an embrace of market-led reforms. At that time, I was privileged to work for the American labor movement opposing PNTR. We warned that PNTR would increase the trade deficit, destroy American jobs, and allow the Chinese government's violations of human rights and workers' rights to continue. Unfortunately, we were right. PNTR assured American companies that they could invest and produce in China instead of at home and enjoy guaranteed access for their Chinese goods back in the U.S. market. As a result, U.S. foreign direct investment in China has increased more than tenfold since 2000, and our trade deficit in goods with China has more than quadrupled, hitting $383 billion last year. This growing deficit has cost millions of jobs. Economists estimate that trade with China has eliminated from 2.4 to 3.7 million American jobs with lasting negative impacts. Communities affected by this job loss also saw rising mortality rates, crime, and societal breakdown. Trade with China has also put downward pressure on wages, eroded union membership, and exacerbated inequality. As imports have grown and our domestic manufacturing sector has been hollowed out, we have become dependent on China for key strategic materials, such as electric vehicle batteries and solar panels and cells. In addition, as American companies were lured to invest in China by the promise of free access to the U.S. market, they were often forced to agree to transfer key technologies, which USTR estimates cost our economy hundreds of billions of dollars each year. In sum, China has shown no willingness to seriously reform its non-market, state-led, mercantilist policies, and American workers and industries have paid the price. Endless negotiations, dialogues, and dispute settlement cases simply have not worked. It is beyond time for Congress to revoke PNTR and deny most favored nation status to China. After it does so, Congress should then establish a new tariff regime for China based on the strategic goals of shrinking our trade deficit, reducing our dependence on China for critical goods and technologies, creating good American jobs, rebuilding domestic supply chains, and advancing our economic and national security. Thank you. Team one. Team two, you have four minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Gallagher, and good afternoon. We're here to argue that revoking permanent normal trade relations with the People's Republic of China is not in the best interest of American families, American workers, or American businesses. Removing PNTR is a declaration of economic war with China an abrupt and destabilizing decoupling of the world's two largest economies. It will hurt the United States and undermine ongoing efforts to work with like-minded countries to reduce our exposure to China. First, let's consider American families. If we revoke PNTR, taxes American pay on some goods would increase from the current level of 25% under the uh, trade war tariffs to 50 to 60%. In some cases, even rising to 90 to 100%, such as in the case of children's toys. Let's look at our two top imports from China, laptops and cell phones. The immediate effect of revoking PNTR would be to place a new 35% tax on these goods, even as U.S. companies are already engaged in moving their supply chains to alternative sites. Some will assert the familiar refrain, China will pay the tariffs. We have already seen this movie. The 2018-19 U.S.-China trade war was the pilot, one that showed very clearly 
uh, for how new higher taxes will affect American families. Study after study of prices at the U.S. border finds that it is American importers, not Chinese exporters, who bear the burden of these taxes. American families are also American workers, and they need and deserve to earn a living wage. Declining opportunities in manufacturing have a long history, as the number of manufacturing jobs was declining well before we granted China PNTR. Part of this decline is due to rising U.S. manufacturing productivity. While we hear about the hollowing out of the U.S. economy, the value of American manufacturing output, now $2.5 trillion, has grown steadily from 2001. It is indisputable that some American workers have been hurt by imports and outsourcing. But the answer is not to bring back jobs that are now going to Vietnam and Thailand. These activities cannot pay a living wage. The issue at debate is not whether some workers have been hurt by import competition. The issue is whether revoking PNTR will help them. We, robust, we robustly assert that revoking PNTR will not help the American worker. The impact of the 2018 trade war shows why more tariffs on Chinese imports will not help American workers. Revocation will hurt U.S. manufacturers. U.S. manufacturers use Chinese intermediate goods to remain competitive, both domestically and in foreign markets. In fact, it's medium-sized uh, manufacturers that rely most on these inputs. High tariffs on Chinese intermediate goods will put thousands of manufacturing jobs at risk. We also know that China will retaliate in ways that hurt U.S. exporters. This predictable response threatens an estimated 1.1 million American jobs supporting U.S. exports in manufacturing, logistics, and services. Revoking PNTR will create jobs, just not in the U.S., in Vietnam, Thailand, and Mexico. These locations are exactly the places that gained U.S. market share during the trade war. These new exporters are deeply tied to China, from whom they receive investment in the components for products that are then shipped to the U.S. Revoking PNTR will not make supply chains shorter, more transparent, or more secure. They will make them longer, more opaque, and less secure. Thank you. Thank you to Team 2 and Team 1, both for staying within the time limit. The gauntlet has been thrown down. The Thunderdome has truly begun. Team 1, you now have three minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first, on the issue of the fact that revoking PNTR would allegedly be too abrupt or would create um, a war is... I think overblown, I think the proposal that I suggested is that Congress consider an alternative tariff structure for China. So not just kick over China to what's called column two of the non-most favored nation, which is what was done with Russia and Belarus, but take a more considered approach, look at the intermediate inputs, look at the impacts in different areas of the economy, and adjust the tariffs on China to specifically address the threat that China uh, poses to American workers, to our economy, and to our national security. And it's certainly treating China like every other country in the world with most favored nation status does not achieve those goals of having a strategic, targeted, comprehensive approach to our tariff policy uh, with regard to China. In terms of the costs that will be imposed, yes, the imports will bear additional costs. And that is the purpose. That is the goal of the policy. I agree that any honest debater would say that it's the importers that bear the cost. Sometimes the Chinese producers will absorb some of it. But that's the, that's the purpose. It's to change incentives in the market. It's to change incentives to not, no longer source from China, to source from our friends and allies, or to source domestically. And so they have to have that bite to uh, have their intended effect. In terms of the U.S. manufacturing sector, yes, it has been on decline for a while. But the studies by economists show that that was greatly accelerated by China's accession to the WTO and the resulting increase in our trade deficit. And in terms of retaliation, I think that's something that we've seen in the 301 context where the Chinese retaliation has much less impact than our measures, and that's because our trading relationship is so lopsided. For every dollar of exports we have to China, we import $3.50 worth of imports. They are much more dependent on our market than we are on theirs. Let's use that leverage to meet our economic and national security goals. All right, we have, of course, higher GDP. We also have higher consumption as a percentage of GDP. That's because China is so dependent on this hugely imbalanced trade surplus that's disrupting economies all over the world, but especially our economy is disproportionately negatively impacted 
by China's continued trade surpluses. And China could do a lot of things to address this. It could stop subsidizing its companies. It could cut down on uneconomic overcapacity in its state-owned enterprises. It could allow its workers to organize, join unions, and bargain for higher wages that would allow them to increase consumption. The choice is China's, what it wants to do to try to reach a more balanced relationship. A lot of those reforms would actually help the Chinese economy as well, but they have shown no willingness to do that. And for us to continue to pretend that they are just another WTO member and we are not allowed to consider any other tariff approaches is simply self defeating Thank you, Team 1. Team 2, you now have three minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear Elizabeth say, and I agree with her, that we should reduce tariffs on intermediate goods imported from China used in made in USA manufacturing. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a 301 exclusion process anymore, despite the requests of many to the Biden administration to institute that. And so what's the result? The result is almost 200,000 lost jobs in the United States since the 2018 tariffs were introduced because American manufacturers can't get the parts that they need at an economical cost to make things in the United States. That's the case for my company. We make mainframe computers in one place in the world only, Poughkeepsie, New York. We import lots of parts and components, many of which we can only find in China. Believe me, we've looked elsewhere. We've paid tens of millions of dollars in tariffs over the last five years, which is just added cost. In fact, tariffs on intermediate goods create incentives for American manufacturers to move their production outside the United States, where they can get cheaper non-tariffed inputs from China. So PNTR is the bluntest of blunt instruments. It's like taking the last five years and amping it up to uh, the maximum volume. It would inflict enormous self-harm on our economy with little economic or strategic benefit. Imagine, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, you as elected officials, if I advocated to you, came to you and said, you should vote for a 35 to 70 percent national sales tax tomorrow, imposed on things like t-shirts, tennis shoes, and toasters. I doubt most of you would think that's a very good idea, but that's what revoking PNTR would do. As Mary said, it would create jobs, but not in the United States. It would create more jobs in places like Vietnam and Taiwan, where the uh, intermediate good production would move to, and it would probably move jobs out of the United States in manufacturing because we could get access to cheaper inputs by making the same thing in Mexico or another country. We would have driven U.S. manufacturing offshore and, importantly, handed the second largest economy on the planet on a silver platter to our foreign competitors from Germany, Japan, Korea, and every other country that will not revoke PNTR or their relationship with China, we would be alone. You hand that market to your competitors. We would have flushed away the number one export market for American farmers, by far, for soybeans, for pork products, for other meat products, for dairy. You would have to pass more farm bills and deal with more farm bankruptcies if we were to revoke PNTR. We would not have created more domestic jobs or resulted in a manufacturing revival, and instead, we would have hurt ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Team 2. Your timing on mentioning soybeans to coincide with Mr. Johnson's arrival was also impeccable. Uh, now the Thunderdome gets even Thunderdome-ier as we enter the cross-examination phase. Team 1, you will have two minutes to cross-examine Team 2, beginning now. Thank you, Chairman. I guess my first question um, to Team 2 be, what can we expect for the next 20 years of having PNTR in place? If China has not complied with WTO rules for the last 20 years, what, how can we expect that to change? What incentive do they have to change their system to an actual market-based system that complies with WTO rules? And let's assume that the appellate body was functioning, but it was functioning for most of the time that China was a member, and they consistently, routinely flouted WTO rules. So, what is your proposal? What, how, what, if the promises that were made in 1999 haven't been met, why would we expect that they would be met now? 
well, there's no question that China has turned away from economic reform, particularly in the last five years. Um, in fact, some of the choices of the Chinese leadership to turn away from the goose that laid the golden egg, the, the, the fact that they were getting richer because they were moving toward a more capitalist economy, uh, they've done more harm to themselves than we could ever do. So I don't disagree that China has, has not met all of the WTO commitments, but I think it's important we recognize the China of 2000 was moving in a market-oriented direction. WTO reforms were part of that. Those reforms were largely implemented, and for the first five to eight years, they were mostly followed. Unfortunately, China has overreached and has turned away from economic reform, and our policy needs to adjust as a result. It did adjust, you could argue, with the 301 tariffs, which is a great test case. The question, I think, Elizabeth, really is, do we dial it up to maximum volume? Do we revoke PNTR because China has not lived up to every commitment? Uh, I think given the amount of self-harm that that would create for the U.S., that would be too blunt of a reaction. Now, Team 2, you get to cross-examine Team 1 for two minutes. Keep in mind their strategy here, which is they could also try and filibuster during the two minutes. It's a very short period of time. We're not senators, but we are familiar with this tactic <laughs> here in the House. But your two minutes begins now. So I, I, I would ask a question. We've had a bit of a pilot project or a test case of what raising tariffs would mean over the last five years. The tariffs imposed by the Trump administration and continued by the Biden administration were supposed to fix the trade deficit, repatriate jobs, open China's market, and not hurt Americans. But the U.S. trade deficit in goods is at an all-time high. Uh, we have not created significant new jobs, particularly in the manufacturing sector, as a result of the tariffs. In fact, we've lost 200,000, as I mentioned, according to the Tax Foundation. American companies have paid over $150 billion in tariffs, $1,500 negative impact per consumer, and it has not produced the bonanza of U.S. purchases that were promised. So why should we think that it makes sense, if the pilot project hasn't worked, to triple down and revoke PNTR? Thank you. Well, the U.S. trade deficit with China did peak in 2018. It did decline after the 301 measures were imposed. The U.S. International Trade Commission did a very detailed study of the impact of the 301 tariffs as well as the Section 232 steel and aluminum tariffs. It found that the 301 tariffs only increased domestic prices for competing products by about 0.2%. So it was not runaway inflation that was created. Obviously, the price of the imports themselves increased, but that was the intention. Um, and also, there was, was an increase in domestic production in a number of the sectors that were covered by the 301 tariffs. There were even stronger increases in the um, steel and aluminum sector, where we also saw increased investment, et cetera. So tariffs can be part of a toolbox of policies to encourage domestic manufacturing. We also need to invest in manufacturing. With this administration, this Congress have done a great job at. So it's one piece of the puzzle, and I do not think they have been a failure. I think that they have had positive impacts, and we can refine that by giving Congress the power to shape tariff policy. Time, okay, time has run out. I'm going to deviate slightly from the script and make my staff very nervous. I'm willing to entertain up to two questions from members, but your answers will be limited to one minute only. And I believe Mr. Auchincloss from the great state of Massachusetts has the first question. Oh, yeah, you need a microphone. Here. I appreciate the back and forth. I've been learning a lot. Uh, there seems to be a, a bit of a log jam with trying to find granular enough tools to to accomplish desired ends. The revocation of PNTR seems too drastic, and yet the status quo feels unsatisfying because clearly things have, been, uh, have not turned out the way we wanted them to when they acceded to the WTO. Um, would both sides support that one middle path would be the reauthorization of the generalized system of preferences, the GSP, which uh, provides for a way to reduce our trade deficit with China by opening up trade to developing nations. Uh, this was an effort that 
the supermajority of this committee has, has supported, and I'd be interested whether, while we're still wrangling with this debate here, reauthorizing GSP, which has been um, out of authorization for three years, would be a good uh, first step. Uh, uh, GSP can be an important tool. I think what's critical is that the rules of origin in the GSP program need to be tightened so that if we are providing trade preferences to Cambodia or other countries, it doesn't just become a conduit for additional imports from China. That doesn't um, benefit us and that doesn't benefit Cambodia or the other developing countries that are meant to be the beneficiaries of uh, GSP. And I think Congress should also look closely at the other conditions of GSP to make sure that they're building sustainable uh, relationships, helping workers, helping the environment in those countries that are benefiting. I think GS, renewing GSP makes lots of sense. It's an important tool for economic development. It's an important foreign policy tool. Um, and I also think that another tool that I wish the administration would consider is having a real uh, strong Indo-Pacific trade agenda. Uh, there are many countries in the region, Australia, Singapore, Japan, and others, who would very much like to have an economic agreement with the United States that does not include China. And I think it was a mistake for us to withdraw from TPP, uh, and I hope we'll reconsider that decision. The second and final member question will come from Mr. Johnson. Uh, we will, after the question is asked in very concise form, then the minute will start, and that will be it. So, Mr. Johnson, question. Playing true to form, Mr. Chairman, I will ask about beans. In any given year, 60% of American soybeans are exported to one country, China. In any year, it exceeds a billion bushel. Whatever shall we do? And I know we think of commodities as perfectly fungible, but you all know that market access is not instantly replicatable. What shall we do with all the soybeans? Thank you, Congressman. Well, the soybeans can be exported to other countries, for example, if China switches to Brazil or another country as its main uh, source of supply, then the other countries that Brazil had been shipping to will be available for the U.S. to ship to. Um, so the, the overall global supply and demand for soybeans doesn't change. The patterns of trade may change if China chooses to retaliate. So if that was the case, why did the price of uh, American soybeans fall by $2 a bushel during the trade war? I think there was a lot of uncertainty, Congressman, about what um, China's reactions were going to be and how far those reactions could go. I think that w the 301, for what I believe has a benefits, does have uncertainty. So having a congressional approach to tariff policy puts things on a more permanent footing and, and kind of helps with that market reaction. Okay, I think our opponents are quite willing to accept costs that are borne by other people. Here it's the soybean farmers or it's the people who are gonna pay higher prices for their toys or their children's shoes. Or what benefit? We still haven't heard what benefit. Is this gonna change Chinese policy? Absolutely not. Revoking PNTR just takes us out of the game, takes the US out of the game. We have tools, robust tools, that were given to the executive by Congress, such as anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Our opponents say those are ineffective. Really? Because what they do is they raise tariffs on particular products, exactly what revoking PNTR would do, except that using the tools that we already have allow us to act surgically and targeted and continue to work closely with our allies, who, if we revoke PNTR and declare economic war on China, will say we're going to distance ourselves from those policies. Thank you to Mr. Johnson, thank you to Team 1, Team 2, and apologies to the, what I'm informed is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts not the state of Massachusetts, right. as the Virginian next to me also is nodding in agreement. <laughs> so apologies for that. We will now move to concluding remarks for the first proposition we're debating. Team one, you have two minutes to conclude. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I hope that I've been clear that I'm not advocating for a blunt approach in which China is just moved to column two as Russia, Cuba, other countries. I am advocating for China to take, uh, for the Congress, excuse me, to take a considered approach to our tariff policy towards China to consider national and economic security concerns when setting the level of tariffs on China. Right now, Congress is deprived of that ability and has to treat imports from China exactly the same as imports from every other country. And the disadvantage that that creates is increasing our trade deficit and destroying jobs 
and uh, hollowing out important uh, manufacturing sectors. What would be the benefit of not having PNTR is it would give Congress the flexibility to take all of those considerations into account when setting our trade policy and our tariff policy with regard to China. That could make change incentives in the market about whether to source from China, source from other countries, or hopefully source from the United States. That's what tariffs are supposed to do, is they're supposed to signal to the market that certain uh, sourcing practices are preferable to others. Um, in terms of ADCBD, no one loves anti-dumping countervailing duties more than I do, but those cases take years to put together, to bring, and the thresholds are so high um, that it cannot address the kind of systemic disadvantage that we're facing in our competition with China. Those tools need to be strengthened. Um, there are very good proposals in Congress to do that, but they alone cannot address the enormity of the problem that we are facing with China. Um, the other point that I would make is that what we have done is created a permanent incentive mechanism for U.S. firms to shift investment out of the United States to China. That needs to change. It can be done through investment measures, but tariff policy also needs to be a piece of that puzzle. For all of these reasons, Congress should consider revoking the NTR for China. Thank you, Team 1. Team 2, you have two minutes to conclude. Thank you, Chairman. We're not here to prosecute the last 23 years. No, we're here to consider what is best for the American people today. Revoking PNTR for China reduces American prosperity and strength. American families, workers, and business owners will pay a steep price for this action, yet we will remain tied to China through longer, less transparent, less secure supply chains. Um, as far as opening up new tools for the Congress, the Congress has already given us a system of administered protection. If those tools need to be strengthened, this is the place to take that up. Um, is Congress really going to begin to write line item tariffs for trade with China? We've already set the principles under which the United States of America will levy tariffs. They're good principles. The tools that we have are strong tools. We should use them. Uh, lastly, let me say that we need to continue to work with our allies to create new places for in in business investment. The belief that U.S. investment in China is there to ship stuff, exports back to the United States is simply false. The Bureau of Economic Analysis data shows that 85% of what is produced by U.S.-owned multinationals in China is sold to China. American companies are in China to sell to China, and that creates jobs back here at home. So in closing, let me say that I think that the cost will be borne by a few people. It's a regressive tax. It's a tax that will hurt our small and medium-sized businesses. We have tools already that we can use surgically and tactically and allow us to continue to work productively with our allies in meeting the China challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Team 2. That concludes the first round of our trade Thunderdome debate. Let's give both teams a round of applause. Now, I'm about to pass it over to the ranking member uh, who will moderate round two. Uh, I just want everyone to know we have a highly scientific process here. We have a team of judges in a, a non-disclosed location analyzing every word, verbal cues, uh, neuro-linguistic programming, and there's a scorecard that will emerge at the end. But I'm just curious, I'm going to ad-lib this, who in the audience, and this may not be free from endogeneity here, raise your hand if you think we should revoke PNTR based on what you just heard. Okay. I guess raise your hand if you side with Team 2 that we should not do that. It seems as though Team 2 has persuaded the audience. Again, but I don't know who these people are. They could be plants, for, for all I know. So that was just an unscientific poll. So let me hand the microphone over to the ranking member, Raja Krishnamurthy, for our second proposition. Thank you so, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to begin with a little bit of an opening statement and then go to the second proposition. Um, you know, today we're having a, a robust debate about trade policy, and we're having it because although Americans want reasonably priced goods and services, they're deeply dissatisfied with the trade imbalance right now in our relationship with China. We had record trade in 2022, but we had nearly a record trade deficit. We imported almost $400 billion more than we exported. That's why the American people think that we're losing when it comes to our trading relationship with China. According to a Pew survey from earlier this year, nearly half of Americans think China is 
the primary winner in our current trade, trading relationship, while only 30% say the U.S. is equally benefiting or is the primary winner. My constituents have various questions about our unbalanced trading relationship. First, they ask, how did this happen? They suspect the PRC refuses to play by global trading rules by enacting lax and environmental laws and, engaged in, and, and engaging in forced technology transfer, IP theft, cyber espionage, and economic coercion like we heard in our hearing last week. Second, they ask, how do we fix this trade imbalance? They sense that producing more at home and opening new markets abroad where partners play by the rules should be a key component going forward. Finally, they ask why we allow critical products affecting our economy, national security, and healthcare to be almost completely manufactured in China. For example, during the early days of the COVID pandemic, we were almost entirely dependent on China for personal protective equipment, such as masks and face shields. When China failed to ship enough PPE, uh, for instance, my wife's hospital ran out of PPE. This is a picture of my wife. She improvised by going to Home Depot and buying this welder's face mask from Home Depot, making her into this samurai doctor looking spectacle. <laughs> Americans are willing to trade with others, but they don't want to solely rely on other nations for items central to our economy or critical to our health or security. We owe the American people answers to these questions today, and I hope in round two and round three, we'll continue to address some of these questions. I just quickly say, uh, Mr. Barr's informed me that that helmet is made in his district. So. Hey. There you go. Thank inform, you. inform your wife. I will do that. Um, okay, so here's the second question for our debate. Should the U.S. impose countrywide export controls on sensitive technology exports to the PRC, or should it favor an entity-by-entity entity approach? Team two, you get to start this round. Both teams will have four minutes for opening statements, three minutes for rebuttal, and two minutes for cross-examination. Both teams will then have two minutes to conclude and we'll try to involve member questions again. So uh, team two, please begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Christian Lichty. Uh, our position is that the United States policy on export control should be one of imposing precision controls on tar that target the most sensitive technologies and their acquisition by the most dangerous end users. The primary security focus, we believe, should be on countrywide controls for specific, well-delineated technologies, using the approach of building higher walls around smaller gardens. Now, this is hard work, and I can say from personal experience, having administered these controls during the Bush administration, when I served at the Commerce Department, it requires detailed technical parameters be written that must constantly be monitored and adjusted as technology upgrades. And it must be applied in areas that are sometimes hard to define. How do you define machine learning or artificial intelligence if you want to regulate its export to China? It's also essential that such controls be, wherever possible and as quickly as possible, applied equally by our allies. Otherwise, if we impose controls unilaterally, we've only plugged one hole in the boat. And target countries can still get all the sensitive... Now, in limited circumstances, we think U.S. objectives could be met through targeted end-user controls. But I would respectfully submit that in the last few years, under both the Trump administration and the Biden administration, we've gotten the balance wrong. There are now more than 700 Chinese companies on the entity list, which means they cannot buy anything, even pencils or paper clips, made in the United States. It's a meat cleaver approach, company by company. Now, there may be some cases of particularly egregious behavior uh, that warrant such a sanction. And indeed, I signed some of those kinds of sanctions when I served in government. But these are a clumsy tool. Companies can change their names, they can use fronts, they can move locations, they can establish partnerships with others, and it requires a tremendous amount of work by the U.S. government and partners to chase down those ties, figure out which company is on the list and which one isn't, 
you have to have experts in, in linguistics to understand the difference in one Chinese company name versus another. It's a bit like playing whack-a-mole at the beach arcade, which I do with my kids. It's very satisfying. You whack them all, but they pesky things come up again. I would argue that putting companies on the entity list gives an impression of doing something, but I think we should put much more emphasis on doing the harder and more strategic work of identifying choke point technologies, controlling them, and getting our allies on board. That's what will do the most to protect our security, and that's what the firma ECRA bill, passed by Congress by an overwhelming majority, including, I believe, most of the members of the committee serving then, that's what the bill called for. And yet, five years later, we have a lot of work left to do. I, I recognize it's not easy. It takes time and patience. But we still have no controls on quantum computing, advanced robotics, or AI software. There were some initial controls on AI-capable chips last October, which may be about to be revised again. But that's the place where we should put our emphasis rather than playing whack-a-mole with the entity list. Finally, I would say restrictive and unilateral controls tend to erode economic competitiveness without achieving our security objectives. We can avoid the hard work of bringing allies on board, as we did on the semiconductor tool controls with Japan and the Netherlands. We need more of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Team one. Thank you. I'd like to offer perspectives from having been on the front line of, US, of the U.S.-China economic war for the last 20 plus years. Over the last 20 years, we built China's economy through tech transfer rather than investing in our own economy. Export controls failed to step up to meet the challenge. Today, according to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, China leads in 37 of the 44 emerging technologies with potential for a monopoly in many of them. China's military is growing faster than our own. And China's stockpile of nuclear war, warheads is rapidly increasing as well. American businesses traditionally believe that if we te transfer technology to China and make some money, our businesses would nonetheless dominate. But that has been wrong. China is able to subsidize, heavily subsidize, the growth of transfer technology much faster th than us. And with its massive population and workforce, continued IP theft and technology misappropriation practices, it is now able to leap over us. For background, let me explain. Export controls work in three ways. One, the product needs to be licensed. The product itself are going to a malign end, uh, for, for the license itself because, for export because of its own dangerous potential. Two, generally an export is regulated because it's going to a malign end user. Three, an export could be regulated because it's going to dangerous end uses like weapons of mass destruction. destruction. And when companies obtain licenses from the Commerce Department for their exports to China, those licenses often come with stipulations from the government. For example, the Commerce Department says that the technology that's being transferred must stay with that specific Chinese recipient. It can't be transferred to another Chinese entity without the U.S. government's authorization. It cannot be used for dangerous capabilities and so forth. But do you think for a minute that the Chinese companies will comply? Absolutely not. Is this just my opinion? Absolutely not. China has a series of laws that demand noncompliance. China's anti-foreign sanctions laws prohibit, let me emphasize, prohibits Chinese persons and entities from complying with U.S. and international restrictions, including U.S. export controls and sanctions. China's national intelligence law also states that entities in China must support the state's intelligence work at all times. China's national security laws mandate the same. Comply with Chinese government directives rather than foreign laws to advance the CCP's objectives. And even more so, the Chinese government regularly limits and often prohibits the U.S. government's end-use checks, so we're not able to detect instances of export control violations within China. That's a mandate from the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. So when the question arises as to whether an entity-based controls work, better or countrywide controls, my answer is informed by these facts. Our licenses are already entity-based. We export to an entity and the license has stipulations. China has been and will continue to evade entity-based controls in addition to the entity list. 
And it's easy to do. Just acquire the control technology or transfer it through another company like a subsidiary, and it's super easy to do when you have the CCP support. In light of all this, the fact that we're licensing with a 93% approval rate sensitive technologies to China, is that sound? Is it rational? That is not a rational policy. China's been misusing American technology to build its own hypersonic capabilities in violation of U.S. export control laws. China's been supplying the Russian military, Iran, with sensitive technology, sensitive U.S. technology, in, viol uh, in violation of U.S. export control laws. And China's violated controls on technology to incentivize, or I'm sorry, to indigenize semiconductor manufacturing at, at home, within its own borders, at a scale that dwarfs ours. So what do we need to do? We need to be much more serious about export controls and be much more forward-leaning. Thank you. Thank you. Team two, your three minutes for rebuttal begins now. Well, I think we agree on the point that China is interested in acquiring advanced technology. The question is what to do about it. Um, I'm not sure what the argument of, of the other team was. It sounded to me as if it might be that we just need to have an embargo on all technology items going to China. Um, I, again, a very blunt approach. Export controls um, are meant to be focused on items that are of strategic importance, uh, but that also have commercial use. And the whole idea is to define what it is that we're, we're worried about. If we don't want China to have anything, I suppose we could have a complete trade embargo, uh, but I don't, I don't think that's what the other team is calling for. The question is, what kinds of controls make sense? I would also caution against the, the, uh, the notion that China is ahead of us in everything. Uh, and I would offer this thought. Look at what's happened in the semiconductor control area. Uh, look at what happened after Huawei was put on the entity list. The Chinese have dumped probably 100 to $200 billion of subsidies into their domestic semiconductor industry over the, at least the last 10 years. They can't make the things, okay? The subsidies are not working. And how do we know that? Because we put an export control or put Huawei on the entity list and they can't get chips from us and they are in very deep trouble. So that's not to say that they don't want, they don't have this aspiration and that that's not a threat. It very much is. But I, I think we have to avoid uh, a reaction saying, you know, China's out to kill us. Uh, they're ahead of us on everything, so we have to stop everything. That, that really sells the American innovation economy short, in my opinion. We are actually ahead in most of the critical technologies that I mentioned, quantum computing, AI, semiconductors, robotics, and so forth. The question is how to preserve that leadership. And I think the right way to do it is to say, these are the technologies we're concerned about at this level of technology that cannot go to China. When I served in the Bush administration, we actually did differentiate between end users. We said you could sell it to a civilian end user, but not the military. That was in 2005, 2006. That's no longer an appropriate distinction to make because of the civil military fusion program that I know all of the members of the committee are very familiar with. So instead of trying to divide between entities and, and having that whack-a-mole game with the entity list, I argue we need to do the harder work. And the especially hard work is saying we want to control this for these reasons and getting the allies on board. The Biden administration did a good job getting the Dutch and the Japanese on board with the semiconductor tools. It's going to be harder in AI because there are more countries that have that capability. But if we don't do that work, then China gets the, gets the technology and it's not in our interest. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, team one, rebut away. Um, thank you. So. There's some troubles with, with the, um, our opponent's argument here. Um, Can you speak all, into the mic? Yes, 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 I'm sorry. There, there's some, I have some trouble with our opponent's arguments here. First of all, with a dangerous adversary that is building up a military to wage war, already helping our allies, we should not be controlling, we should not be exporting any sensitive technologies at all. Um, China doesn't also fundamentally, right, our, our, um, the, the opposing team already concedes. China doesn't distinguish between end users. Okay, well, if it doesn't, then how do we advocate, how is our opponent team advocating for precision, precision nuanced controls? 
to, to restrict the most sensitive technologies to the most dangerous entities. Well, didn't we just say that there's no disting distinction between end users in China because of the civil mil military fusion strategy? Don't we already acknowledge that commerce's ability to conduct end use checks is severely constrained by the, by the CCP? Then how do we go in a nuanced way when China is circumventing, has been circumventing all along, and we can't catch it? High walls, and narrow fence. I'm sorry, when you're trying to stop an opponent in a race, you put as many hurdles in front of them as possible. You put one hurdle, they are going to overcome it. Example, we've been begging ASML, the Dutch company with the, with the um, technology to make the uh, most leading edge chips. We've been asking them to not export technology to China. Despite that, China's at seven nanometers. People are gonna say, oh, you know, well, China's throughput isn't good. Chinese, 30% throughput is just fine for the Chinese because they're just gonna throw money at the problem. Multilateral controls versus unilateral controls, yes, we absolutely have to ultimately get to uh, multilateral, but that doesn't mean we wait until all of our allies w uh, walk in lockstep with us at the exact same time. The United States needs to move first to demonstrate to our allies that this can be done and also importantly to provide to them top cover. They will not move first until the United States move first. So it's just a delaying tactic that I'm completely over, right? We can't move multilaterally all the time first. We can approach our allies, and if they say no, we've got to show leadership, we've got to move ahead. Um, when it comes to national security, there is no balance between economic interests and national security interests. We need to move first and foremost to protect our national security interests. Business interests, you know, our business is going to lose out the same exact way that we built China's economy over the course of the last 20 years, plus years, we can build the economies of our allies, our friends, and, and export to them, make up those lost revenues from the Chinese economy to our allies' markets. Um, if we continue with this nuanced way, we're just playing the whack-a-mole game, we're wasting our resources, and we need to be building up America rather than wasting resources playing whack-a-mole with China. Thank you. Thank you. Now we begin cross-examination. Team two, you have two minutes. Thank you. Well, we, we've heard some controversial claims with little evidence. Um, I think our colleagues overstate the role that U.S. firms have had in building Chinese science and technology. I think American companies and the American government have learned a lesson, and they're smarter than that. I also think that when we view this as strictly zero sum, we lose any ability to understand what nuanced and precision focused policy might be. And yet that's exactly what we are advocating for, to prioritize technologies, focus on targeted entities, and then really provide the resources for us to make these controls work. Um, our the opposing team argues that national security trumps economic security. I would argue that economic security is essential for national security. And when we look at the, our tech companies, we see that they, some companies in the chip design sphere are plowing 40% of their revenue back into, uh, their profits back into R&D. In other words, we need healthy companies to continue to support U.S. military. We have the world's best technology because we have the best, best technology companies. And so it's very important for us to consider the economic health of our companies along with other considerations in national security. If we don't pursue, uh, if we pursue policies that are restrictive and overly broad, the world will just build around U.S. companies. U.S. companies or inventors will move offshore and will lose the ability to maintain our cutting edge technology that supports and undergirds our national security. Thank you. I'm going to let Rob Whitman ask a question now. I'll give him uh, two minutes, I guess. Go ahead. And you can direct, just tell, who, tell us who you're directing it to. Thank you, Raj. I'd like to go to the Honorable Padilla. Um, in your perspective on tactics, you say that countrywide export controls need to be precision controls when it relates to sensitive technology exports. How do you accomplish this when China has a stunning lead in 37 of 44 technologies, both critical and emerging technologies, in defense, 
space, energy, and biotechnology. How does precision counter a tactic of economic carpet bombing in these critical elements of our economy? Well, Congressman, when I say precision, precision doesn't mean not tough. Precision means you don't try to control things that are generally available on the global market, that are commodities that the Chinese can buy anywhere. What it means is you impose tough controls on the things that really do matter. Let's take semiconductors, for example. Um, semiconductor industry moves very fast. The product life cycle is generally 18 months. We should be controlling and have been historically controlling the latest cutting edge semiconductors and two or three generations behind that, we've been saying cannot go to China. And that's been US policy really for the last 20 years. Uh, that to me makes more sense than saying to uh, Intel, you can't sell a chip that is 10 generations behind state of the art to go into an Apple iPhone that's made in Shenzhen and then sold all over the world. Uh, if we tried to do that, if we tried to control things that are broadly available, I don't think allies would follow, and I agree with Mary that production would tend to move outside the United States. Great. Now, Richie Torres, please ask a question, and if you could direct it at team one. You have two minutes. For the Honorable Nakatar, I hopefully I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, I mean, you've made a persuasive argument that export controls are imperfect, or precision export controls are imperfect, but but I feel like your burden is not to show that it's imperfect, but that it's better than the alternative, which is either no export controls or overbroad export controls. And do you, do you dispute that the export controls that were put in place on October 7th of 2022 have not been effective at slowing down China with respect to the AI competition? Um, and, and as a related matter, if, if we were to put in place overbroad export controls, and one of our leading companies like NVIDIA were to suffer a substantial loss of revenues, maybe that would stifle uh, Chinese competitiveness, but it would also undercut our competitiveness as well. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Um, so with respect to the October 7 controls, look, they were a great first move. We needed to do something like that. Um, I, and I loved Jake Sullivan's speech where he sort of reiterated what we were doing last administration, which is you know move unilaterally and then have allies follow. But some of the problems with the rules, the rules aren't perfect and we gotta keep pushing to make them better if we're gonna make a difference in this country. The rules right now, the Chinese companies can reincorporate outside China and be exempt from the, from the most strictest of the rules, the presumption of denial. All of allowing foreign produced items, right, to only just go to those, with, with a uh, presumption of denial to those enti uh, 28 entity listed companies, we're just going to turn around and give it to all the other entity listed companies and everybody else in China, that's another problem. The fact that we're limiting the controls to the lowest uh, nodes allows China to build overcapacity in the higher nodes and displace us from R&D. And so, in short, there's, there's more things that we need to be doing there. Thank you. Okay, now let's, we're going to the conclusion. Team two, you have two minutes for your concluding remarks. So I would conclude by saying it, it appears to me that, that the opposing team is suggesting something close to a technology embargo on China. Just as they advocated for the cutting off of PNTR, a very blunt instrument that would hurt America, a technology embargo would also hurt America. As with PNTR, it's unlikely that any allies would follow suit. The United States would be acting alone, trying futilely to control technologies that are long ago decontrolled and widely available on the global market. And by trying to capture too much, the risk is we won't pay attention to stopping what really is important. That's what higher walls around smaller gardens means. And that has been the bipartisan approach to export control policy since the end of the Second World War. There are always disagreements between industry and the government, between Congress and the administration about where to draw those lines. How, how far to turn the dial? Uh, do we need to update the October 7th controls to make them more stringent, as, as it appears the administration is about to do? That's a healthy debate. The administration has to take account of where technology stands and what strategic objective we're trying to accomplish. But precision does not mean weak. It means intelligent and effective. 
finally, I would say this is hard work. It is hard work to, to identify those controls and especially to get allies on board. We probably need a new international control regime. The Vassanar arrangement, which some of you may have heard of, 30 years old, has Russia as a member and, and with veto power. It is no longer effective as a way to agree internationally on what should be controlled for export. If we really are serious about this, I would urge the administration to launch a new international export control regime with our NATO and major non-NATO allies and do the hard work to keep our technological edge. Thank you. Thank you. Team one. Okay, let me just start with the fact that China's military advancements in hypersonic weapons was facilitated by the transfer of U.S. technology. One company's short-term profits years ago now threatens global security. Our export control system failed. We need to fix it. Uh, so, yes, absolutely. I am for a position of embargoes on sensitive critical technologies to all of China because of the civil fusion and all of the ways this China circumvents. Um, if we transfer it to an entity, it will fall into the wrong hands. Um, precision, we keep using the word precision. What does that mean when you're looking at within China? When s uh, circumvention is abound, when you, for crying out loud, have the uh, anti-foreign sanctions law that demand that the CCP, that the Chinese companies evade U.S. export controls. So we've got to really not use fancy words and be really practical in, term in what we're talking about. Um, we are talking about, you know, uh, our semiconductor export controls to China. We, we talked about it a second ago. They're still not working because we've given exemptions to companies. And Under Secretary Estevez just uh, a few weeks ago or a month ago basically just stated that he's going to give those exceptions to those companies for one more year. So really, do we have the controls? I'd probably say no, right, not, not right now. Um, and then companies need R&D money? Absolutely. So let's say you send some control technology to China, and China just gives you a little bit of money. That money that you have pales, pales in comp comparison to the money that the CCP is going to give that company to grow that technology, the workforce, everything that's going to throw at it. So that in comparison, the few million dollars the U.S. gave, uh, it got pales in comparison to how the CCP has been able to grow that technology and displace the, uh, the Chinese entity. Look. I am not for, I, I'm a realist, and when I look at the Chinese economy and I know how it operates, we cannot trust the transfer of anything sensitive to it, not when it's an adversary. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes round two. Thank you to the ranking member. We are now going to move to our third and final question in what has been a very spirited debate thus far, not since... Lincoln versus Douglas, or Nixon v. Kennedy, or Musk versus Zuckerberg has a debate this robust, rocked the halls of Congress and the social media landscape. So we hope to continue that spirit leading into the third and final round where we'll be debating the question, venture capital, private equity, and other direct investments, which account for around 15% of all U.S. capital flowing into China, 15% of all U.S. capital flowing to China. If venture capital and private equity funds are banned from investing in Chinese emerging tech companies, should similar controls be placed on access to American capital markets? Team one, you're up first. As always, four minutes to open, three to rebut, two to cross-examine, and two to close. So team one, take it away. Thank you. So I've already described China's deliberate predatory tactics to strengthen themselves right through export controls at our expense. So to be clear, this is not an issue of free trade or protectionism. We're talking right now about self-defense against an adversarial foreign nation. Uh, one of the major areas where there's gaps in, in our laws in, in preventing China's growth is the absence of capital flow restrictions to foreign adversaries. Foreign adversaries that are preparing to wage war or are waging war against the United States and our allies. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, China's relentless terrorization of Taiwan, and ongoing actions to harm and, and to arm and embolden other U.S. adversaries. As a threshold matter, China restricts and heavily scrutinizes U.S. investments within, a, within its own borders and Chinese investments abroad to protect its own national security interests. So why would we not do the same? We have sanctions, but then are they being? But they're being used sporadically and very lightly, as they currently are 
so we need something more comprehensive. At the end of 2020, U.S. investments in Chinese companies totaled, counting both public and private equity, over $2.3 trillion. Adding 2021 and 22 FDI flows, we're at approximately $2.5 trillion. Breaking this down, we've invested about $50 billion in Chinese companies that we've entity listed due to malign activities. PRC state-owned companies, approximately $152 billion. Chinese military companies, $55 billion. That's more than we're investing domestically through the CHIPS Act. Telecommunications, $43 billion. Biotechnology, $51 billion. Artificial intelligence, $221 billion. China semiconductors, $21 billion. Those are just examples. And as of, the, as of January 2023, there were 252 Chinese companies listed on U.S. exchanges with a total market capitalization of over one trillion. Compounding this fact is the additional transfer of our technologies and supply chains, right? Money, technology, we need to curb all this. The U.S. Department of Treasury has prohibitions on U.S. capital flows to Chinese military industrial complex companies, but there are only about 68 companies on that list. That's hardly enough, and the prohibitions extend only to the purchase and sale of publicly traded securities, not private capital flows. And do you know how many Chinese entities we've sanctioned through financial, our financial sanctions, individual or, uh, individuals or companies? 413 broken out, 253 entities, and the rest are individuals, 160. What about the rest of China's military industrial comp complex, the rest of Chinese companies that are involved in genocide, those that are helping Russia's war efforts in Ukraine, those that are helping Iran and North Korea grow, those that are collecting our genetic information for malign biological weapons de development. Those that are weaponizing AI against America and the rest of the world. Why are we not restricting financial transactions with those entities? We absolutely need outbound investment limitations on capital transfers to the CCP-controlled China, venture capital, private equity, and other investments. Let me add that we cannot afford to have legislation that only requires notifications to the U.S. government that they're transferring capital abroad. That's just kicking the can down the road. The U.S. government already has the ability to review these companies' uh, activities with China through their SEC filings, to know their investment exposure, exposure. We have census data, as we already know what's happening. And the more we make the weight, the more we're allowing our dollars to strengthen the CCP. Time is running out. The Chinese Communist Party has already announced that it is planning a war sometime between 2024 and 2027. We cannot wait any longer. We need to strengthen our capabilities at home rather than China's. Thank you. You are recognized for four minutes. Well, Mr. Chairman, I start by feeling as if, if we adopt all the proposals of the opposing team, we may very well hasten the war that I hope we'd all like to avoid. There's not many cases in history where economically isolating a country has produced better behavior on its part. If so, North Korea would be a peaceful and friendly paradise. There are plenty of cases in which improperly or overly blunt economic sanctions were used that convinced an already aggressive power that its only alternative was to lash out. Getting into capital market controls is a risky business. That's something China does. They've always controlled their capital market. It's also something debt-stricken countries like Argentina do. It's not something the United States has done because open capital markets are a critical element of our economic strength. So we need to tread very carefully indeed in this area. I'll make three points. First, the market is already addressing some of this problem. U.S. foreign direct investment in China declined by 76% year over year in 2022. Part of that was due to COVID shutdowns, but a lot of it was American investors choosing to prioritize their FDI elsewhere. Why? Because of China's turn away from economic reform. They are killing their own golden goose. An American Chamber of Commerce in China survey found that for the first time in 25 years last year, a majority of American companies said China is no longer a top investment priority. 65% of members said they don't think China is open to their business anymore. Almost half of them said they are not planning any new investments, and another 10% said they're planning to cut investment. 
So the market is doing some of this for us already because of the decisions of the Chinese leadership to turn away from economic reform. Second, the question is, would it work? As Congressman McHenry pointed out in a recent letter to Secretary Yellen, China has $3 trillion in foreign reserves and a $400 billion current account surplus. Do we realistically think that putting a control on U.S. outbound investment is going to prevent money from going to the companies that Nizak talked about? They can just move the money from someplace else. And that's the fundamental point. If you're controlling technology or goods, you can control them because they exist. Money is fungible. Once it's inside China, how do you control where it goes? If you make an investment in an adjacent sector to a sector we're concerned about, how do you prevent that money from then flowing into an area you're concerned about? Inside the U.S., we can do it because we have visibility into our own banking system, but you don't have that in China. So that brings you to the question, do we do nothing? I don't think we should do nothing. In fact, the Business Roundtable has said that there is a good case to be made for restricting uh, U.S. investments from venture capital or private equity funds into Chinese companies in certain sectors if those investments are accompanied by management or technical expertise being transferred to the investing or the company that's being invested in. This could be a good focus, and I think this is where the Treasury Department is headed. This would prevent the most egregious cases of U.S. VC or private equity money funding a company that we're concerned about. How do we implement it? A review process, and Mazak advocated not just a review, but a denial of everything, that's not a very good approach. Instead, we have tools that we can use. I think Mr. Barr has suggested the idea of, if we know we're worried about that AI company in China, put them on the Treasury sanctions list. Make them an SDN, and then they get nothing. No American dollars, no euros, or anything else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Team One, your three minutes for rebuttal begins now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First of all, the other side uh, exaggerates our position and says that it will be extremely risky and bring us to war with China. We're already living in that risk-filled environment. The question is, how do we respond to reduce the risks to the American people? And a clear piece of that has to be restricting the uh, outbound investment in sensitive sectors with sensitive uh, technologies. And yes, um, I acknowledge the Business Roundtable has, and the executive order covering venture capital and private equity, and yes, that's the worst, the most egregious, is when the U.S. know-how is uh, helping these sectors in China. But passive investment is also helping these sectors develop in China. And that money, that money is fungible, but why are we adding money to the pot? Why are we, the American investors, pension funds, uh, other investors, helping China advance towards its industrial policy goals in these key sectors? That kind of capital should also be looked at in any outbound investment mechanism. And nothing, the intention of these sort of outbound investment uh, screens is not to get China to behave better. I think we've seen with their WTO membership Giving them market access didn't make them behave better. And I think the same is with investment. Keeping open investment flows isn't going to change their minds. And so we need to think first and foremost about what is the, going to be the impact of these investments on American workers and on American competitiveness. China has already targeted the industries that it wants to dominate globally by 2025. And I take them at their word. They are going to dominate these sectors, especially if we continue to provide the capital to help them to do so. And so I think the outbound investment screening ne mechanism needs to be broader in terms of the types of capital um, that are covered, needs to be broader in terms of the type of sectors that are covered. China identified 10 and it's made in China 2025. That's a good place to start. We can, there are others that we should also be um, concerned about, especially when we know that when those outbound investments are being made, it's not just the monetary support or the know-how support, but China still, the government of China still imposes technology transfer requirements, even if it promised that it would not do so. And so even that kind of investment can be very dangerous and very risky in terms of helping 
China meet its goals to dominate critical sectors of the global economy, that money can be better invested at home. And that would help American workers, it would help our economic security, and it would help our national security. Team two, your rebuttal. You have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, team one has clarified that they're not saying that we should ban all investment in China. That's good, because that would be inconsistent with American values. However, they seem to imply that it's American capital that's making the difference between whether China realizes it's made in China 2025, which, by the way, is getting rather close and they haven't gotten there yet, or not. China doesn't need our capital. China has too much capital. People save 40%. They don't need our capital. Would they like our know-how? Sure, they would like our know-how. And we've already talked about export controls and other ways to prevent that transfer. U.S. companies also see Chinese companies as future competitors and have gotten smart in terms of what to transfer and how to transfer operations to China. Uh, Team One claims that China still forces tech transfer. In some cases, that's probably true. I wouldn't say that you couldn't find an example. In my own research, I have found that the best companies do not enter into JVs unless they are able to use second tier technology. In other words, US companies are just smarter than that. So. I would say that U.S. companies are already addressing the problem, as my colleague stated. Um, the U.S. government is already addressing the problem by setting up a limited review process. We don't need to go any further in terms of limiting U.S. investment into China. Compete, cooperate, confront. We can't only be about confront. We have to compete as well. And I think U.S. companies see opportunities in China where they can, yes, earn a profit, not a dirty word. They can create jobs here in the U.S. to support those operations. And we should be encouraging healthy competition between the two countries. Why? First of all, it's good for U.S. businesses, keeps them innovating, keeps them fresh. Secondly, it allows us to transfer those profits into future R&D and keep the U.S. technological edge. Clearly, there are some areas where we're concerned about. We've already covered those, I think, at great length. And adding more sort of sledgehammer-type investment restrictions simply is just not helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Because we're running low on time, I'm going to move to a member question. Uh, Mr. Barr. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Padilla, I like your... Um uh, argument that um, capital market controls is typically something that we would see from China, not the United States, and also that uh, capital flows are fungible. I, I sympathize with that. Uh, but, uh, Dr. Lovely, Americans still hold $1.2 trillion in Chinese debt and equity securities. Um, so that's a... Uh, they need, they need that money, I think. So what is the better way to restrict investment in Chinese entities that threaten our national security? Is it uh, the precision, as you say, uh, Mr. Padilla, of OFAC, SDN, full blocking sanctions, high walls on fewer gardens? Or is it a multi-agency uh, reverse CFIUS or National Critical Capabilities Defense Act type uh, blunt instrument and why? One minute. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think it's in most cases the former, Mr. Barr. And the reason I say that is because I participated in CFIUS when I was in government. Regulators often like the approach of saying, "Bring it all in for a review. We'll have a look, see, and if we see something we don't like, we'll let you know." It's sort of the Potter Stewart approach to regulation. We'll know it when we see it, right? They won't tell you what's prescribed. They'll just say, bring it all in for review. We'll, we'll let you know. You'll get that phone call in the middle of the night saying you can't do it, or maybe three or six or 12 months later, you'll, you, you'll be allowed to proceed. That's the way China regulates. It should not be the way we regulate. Whatever regulations we decide on, they should be transparent, clear, and efficient. We should say, this is what you're not allowed to do. This is who you're not allowed to invest in. And, we make it, and everybody plays by the same rules. Um, and I think your recommended approach of using the SDN list would accomplish that better than the idea of a review mechanism, which is what we seem to be heading toward. Mr. Auchincloss. Um, I'm going to ask a complimentary question to what Mr. Barr asked. It seems like 
the, the disagreement we're hearing in this third, the second and third parts of this debate is not so much that China poses a threat in uh, technology and, and its use of capital, but the degree of confidence we have in our ability to define the garden to what size the garden should be and how good the government is at building a wall uh, and preventing people from scaling it and doing it in a predictable way. Um, and I wonder if we're thinking about it in the, in the wrong way. As in, instead of saying the U.S. government in a centralized way is going to control who can invest in what, and, and Mr. Padilla, you point out how challenging that can be to enforce, and it gets out of, out of whack very quickly, we instead define not entities but outcomes. And Dr. Wu, who's with us uh, today, has proposed uh, a liability-based regime in which uh, companies are liable for outcomes from their investments or actions. To say you are liable if your investments or if your tech transfer produces A, B, or C outcomes in, in CCP military capability, you are liable for uh, prosecution of the Uyghur people, you are liable for any malfeasance with genetics collection, etc. And we can define outcomes quite clearly, uh, but put the onus on the private sector on a case-by-case -case basis to to um, abide by them. So people can plant wherever they want, to continue with the analogy, but they have to also keep the weeds out on their own. Is this something that both, both teams could subscribe to, or do you still, do you, do you think that you need to have the entity list and the, and the five W's defined by government ahead of time? Um, so I think the liability idea is a very good one, but I think that's something that um, would be a piece of the puzzle and not a replacement for an outbound investment screen or the export control measures um, that we've been discussing because it takes some um, work to discover that the violation has happened to mount the case, and it's always going to be after the fact. And the goal of both the export control regime and the outbound investment regime is to prevent the harmful transaction from happening in the first place. And in many cases, it can't be unwound. There, now, obviously, if a company knows it's going to be liable, hopefully that will create an incentive not to engage in the bad behavior. But sometimes the company may think, well, this isn't going to cause a problem at all. They said that it's purely for a civilian use, and then it ends up in military hands. And that, at that point, liability alone isn't going to be enough to fix the problem. So it's a very creative proposal. It's a very um, helpful piece of the approach, but I don't think it can substitute or preventative screens to prevent technology and investment in um, dangerous and critical areas. Quickly, we'll give you a minute. No. Uh, I, I think a liability approach is an interesting one. I would want to specify the liability is enforced by a government agency and not by the plaintiff's bar. Uh, I don't think we want to create a private right of action for people to sue uh, companies because uh, we've got enough of that already. Okay. Dr. Dunn has a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Kudos on the format and you and to you and the ranking member. Uh, such a great group to, to listen to. It's been very fascinating. Uh, my question is on the de minimis uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, obviously, these have been in place since 1938. Uh, uh, you know, government uh, law raised the de minimis threshold just to make it easier for, on themselves collecting uh, tariffs on low-value imports, uh, and, and it does simplify the process. Uh, uh, we, I want to know what your opinion is. How important is it to, for us to close the de minimis loophole, which is, you know, it's up to $800 now, and, and of course China is sneaking around the edge, and they're not the only country, and they're, <laughs> and they're, they're shipping things, you know, to Mexico and then one by one to us and, and uh, getting around it that way. Uh, so I was wondering how important do you think it is to close that? Because it looks like it's a whole lot of money coming in at a little bit at a time. To whom uh, do, do you want to direct your question? I'm sorry, who, who feels? I mean, let's... Uh, Dr. Lovely. All right. I think there's some concern about de minimis that's surely legitimate. Um, de minimis, however, we have to remember was ex to expand opportunities. Uh, for trade that didn't require the apparatus of having a, you know, licensed customs broker, et cetera. So it was to promote trade. I think that we should be trying to get de minimis raised in other countries. We're here in the United States trying to expand access to the internet 
and to e-commerce for rural locations, for small entrepreneurs, small crafters, et cetera, who could use this mechanism to uh, earn income. And we see it through an, entirely through a national security lens instead of through an economic development lens. I think that we have methods for screening these packages. We, as you have stated, we already have rules. There is some circumvention of the rules for sure. But we have failed, I think, in expanding de minimis in other places that would allow our small and family-owned businesses to take advantage of e-commerce and grow their own incomes. Mr. Torres, um, my question. You, may, I, may I briefly respond that I, I would that I would greatly support closing the de minimis loophole. It's a huge loophole. It's been especially exploited by China, by companies that set up their entire corporate structure to bring in small packages that are under the threshold, that escape duties, that escape regular customs inspections, that may not be complying with health and safety requirements, may be violating intellectual property. And this may have been a common sense loophole as it was conceived, but it's been completely turned on its head. We've had the exception gobbling up the rule. And so I'm afraid that with respect to China, lowering it back to $200 wouldn't do the trick. I think for non-market economies that have exploited the loophole, they should not be allowed to use it. Our level is already way higher than any of our trading partners, but China in particular, given their behavior exploiting this loophole, should not be allowed to use it at all. Thank you, Mr. Drake. Mr. Torres. Uh, Mr. Padilla, two questions. First, um, would you support delisting Chinese companies that are out of compliance with American securities law? And then second, you know, in the previous round, you made a powerful case for precision export controls, but it seems contradictory to permit the financing of technologies whose exportation is prohibited. It would seem to me consistency requires aligning our export controls with our investment controls. And I know you made the point that China has ample capital, but the private sector, the American private sector, is going to be much more efficient at deploying that capital than the CCP. Uh, so those are my two questions. Uh, on your first question, the answer is yes. I think if a Chinese company violates the rules, they should be delisted. Um, I think there, it's important to point out, in my, in my experience, in my observation, there's a real difference between the attitudes of sort of traditional companies who are actually investing less in China, the traditional foreign direct investment of building a plant or owning a joint venture or something. A lot of what we're talking about here is, is basically Wall Street money, right? And some of the pension funds and venture capital and other things. And I'm not, you know, my, my personal opinion is Wall Street's been a little bit late to catch up to see what's actually happening in China. I mean, I think in some cases they think it's still the China of the late 1990s, not the China uh, of the last 10 years under Xi Jinping. Um, having said that, I recognize there's an inconsistency between what I've argued on the goods and technology side and the money side. And the reason is because they're fundamentally different because money is fungible and much harder to control. So I think the way to approach it is through a tool that works well, and that's the SDN list. I just wanted to quickly add, so um, on the PCAOB issue, I mean, I, I would support delisting them, but let's be absolutely clear. I used to audit Chinese companies for the U.S. government for a number of years. Everything is fake, the, the books, the records, the everything. So I, only, I entirely think that PO, PCAOB structure, the whole thing needs to be re-envisioned. In terms of financing, does, does our money finance technology? Um, it absolutely does. And let me be clear, export controls are not enough because China will still steal technology, get into a cyber attacks, all of that. So then once we transfer capital to it, now that it's stolen technology, we're going to help them build it up. We need a multi-pronged approach. So thank you for that question. Okay. We will now move on to concluding remarks. Team one, you are recognized for two minutes. Okay. Thank you. So Dr. Lovely uh, says that China doesn't want our money, but then Mr. Padilla says that restrictions are going to hasten a war. So then obviously they do want our money. But look, remember, the CCP has the same financial capital flows restrictions, similar ones, same ones on us. The restrictions won't cause war. The CCP's malign ambitions will. The only deterrence is to restrict capital flows to prevent the CCP from growing stronger. They depend on our money, so we need to use that as leverage. And we're not talking about unilateral or multilateral, all that. If we restrict capital transfers, our allies will do the same, and then we're able to slow China down. Look, let me be clear. This is a zero-sum game. Every dollar invested in CCP, in 
in CCP China is a dollar away from U.S. enterprise and the economies of our allies. And if we want to maintain America's position as the leader in the global world order rather than the CCP, then we need to invest at home. And ideally, that wouldn't be just the, government, the U.S. government's position. I hope that American corporations will also believe in building America's capabilities as well. We have young men and women putting their lives on the line to defend this nation. We cannot ask them to do that when we are simultaneously strengthening our adversary. We are at an inflection point in this country. We either choose America or we choose the adversary. We cannot have it both ways. In sum, remember, the more we invest in China's economy, the more money that businesses transfer to China to avail themselves of China's distorted capital structure, forced labor, other market distortions, the more American businesses build China's capabilities rather than our own, then the more we are weakening our position and allowing China to, do to dominate the global economic order. In this way, we're accelerating the demise of capitalism and our market-based system. We need a fundamental change. Thank you. Thank you. Team two, you have two minutes to conclude. Yeah, if trade and investment were a zero-sum game, that means that you only have winners and you only have losers. Why would there be any trade and investment then? Unless, why would the losers trade and invest unless they're all stupid? Trade and investment are not a zero-sum game. They never have been. They are a win-win game done intelligently. And when I hear this debate uh, and what we hear from our opponents is China is very big, it's very scary, it's overtaking us, we're falling behind, the end is near. I remember the comments of Larry Kudlow, who was President Trump's national economic advisor. And he said, you know, we should have more confidence in our own system. America works, and we work because we are open. We're open to trade and investment and capital and ideas and people. That is our secret sauce. We don't want to compete with China by being more like China. The record of state capitalism, particularly the kind, it's not even state capitalism anymore, the record of turning away from economic reform such as we've seen in China the last 10 years is a record of failure everywhere it's been tried. So I think we should respond to China not by being afraid of China. I think we should respond intelligently, intelligently and effectively to the fact that the China of today is not the China of 20 years ago. We need to dial up our export controls. We need intelligent foreign investment restrictions. We may need even to make better use of our trade tools, as Dr. Lovely explained. We should not abandon the relationship to do so is to run up the white flag as America, and I don't think that's what any of us want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both Team One and Team Two. Thank you for all of our to all of our debaters for a very uh, spirited exchange, uh, and uh, I found this to be fascinating. Um, in the original Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, the saying was. Two men enter, one man leaves. But in this case, in this Thunderdome, we have all left smarter than uh, we were when we entered this Thunderdome. So thank you, and please join me in thanking our participants for an incredible debate. And once we get the tallies from the judges, I'll let you know who won. <laughs>